Hi everyone, it's Connor here from Durham Hearing Specialists. I hope you're doing well and welcome to another video. We're going to be talking about a very interesting condition today called cauliflower ear, otherwise known as boxer's ear or auricular hematoma. And it's, you'll, you will have seen it before. It's usually found amongst boxers, MMA fighters, or people who play contact sports like rugby, for example. And it's characterized with this sort of puffy, swollen deformity of the outer ear, essentially, which is permanent if it's not treated um, in a timely manner. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump in and draw some anatomy, and I'm going to explain to you exactly how cauliflower ear forms and how it's treated. Okay, so what we have here is an anatomical diagram which I drew earlier for another video. And what we're interested in is this portion right here. So the outer ear, you can think of it pretty much like a cartilage scaffold with skin on top. However, there is a bit more going on, um, which again is crucial to understanding cauliflower ear. There's actually a, a, another layer in between the cartilage and the skin, which is very important, and I'll explain that now. So if we do a, a kind of schematic drawing of it, imagine we've taken a slice of the external ear. So we have skin, and then the cartilage sandwiched in between, and then we have more skin, like so. So skin, cartilage, skin. Very straightforward. Now, the important thing to know about cartilage is that it is avascular. So it doesn't matter where the cartilage is in your body or which, which type it is. Um, it will have no blood vessels running through it. There's no capillary network there to nourish it directly. So, and in this case, we have elastic cartilage, which is pretty much only found in the ears. There's a little bit in your throat, but um, elastic cartilage is essentially um, a, a combination of collagen fibers and elastin fibers. And elastic cartilage, as the name suggests, has the ability to sort of be squished and deformed and folded and it will then jump back, jump back to its original place. So, and then you have hyaline cartilage, which is found in the ribs and nose, and then you have uh, fibrous cartilage, which is um, able to withstand quite a bit of pressure. So that would be found in your back, sandwiched between your, your vertebrae. But this elastic cartilage, like the others, does not have uh, any blood vessels running through it. But it is living tissue. So, and these little circles that I've drawn here, the, these represent uh, cells, the cells that are found inside, resident inside the cartilage, and they're called chondrocytes. And chondro, anything with chondro in the name basically means cartilage, uh, and that's because chondros is Greek for cartilage. And site just means cell, so chondrocyte is cartilage cell. And chondrocytes are basically kind of embedded within the cartilage and they help maintain the cartilage matrix. And by matrix I just mean structure, essentially. So, because it doesn't have any blood vessels, how do you think it gets oxygen and nutrients? Well, it does so via this special layer of connective tissue, which kind of wraps around the cartilage like a present, or like cling film, essentially. And this is called perichondrium. And again, peri just means about or around in Greek. So, perichondrium around cartilage, essentially. So, as you can see, it's a special layer in between the skin and the cartilage. <clears throat> and this does have a blood supply. In fact, it has a few amazing properties, which we'll talk about in a minute. But let's just draw the blood supply in there. And there we go. So the way that this works is that the cartilage will receive oxygen nutrients via diffusion, which is essentially a process where something goes from a high concentration to a low concentration. So if you imagine, for example, you had a bath full of water and on one side of the bath, you carefully poured a cup of very salty water and, and put that in. If you come back a couple of hours later, the likelihood is that the, the entire bath will taste slightly salty. And that's because, as you would expect, the salt basically kind of diffuses out and kind of spreads out across the entire bath, given, the amount, given enough time. So the salt is moving from a high concentration, a high concentration of salty water, and it's kind of spreading out. And you'll find that that's fairly common in nature and in the universe. So the universe likes things to be kind of spread out and balanced and equal. So that's what diffusion is. And when you breathe in, so you breathe in and your heart pumps. So it's now pumping uh, oxygenated blood around your body. At some point, there will be a high concentration of oxygen in the perichondrium 
um, and that will then just kind of want to naturally diffuse out into the cartilage and waste products will want to diffuse back into the perichondrium and back into its capillary network. So that's normally how the cartilage survives all around the body. But what do you think is going to happen if the ear sustains, sustains some damage? So let's imagine that we get punched, okay? And just as a side note, most of the time when these injuries happen, whether you're playing rugby or you get punched, the force is never usually directly dead on to the side of, of the head. So it's never usually sort of 90 degrees like perpendicular. So it's, it's not usually the case that the ear is being directly kind of squished inwards. Usually, for example, if you get punched, okay, usually what will happen is the force will be exerted inwards and then traveling from behind. So what you'll have is the fist will come in and it will punch you kind of like that. So the fist is actually traveling backwards. So what you have is this kind of shearing effect. So the, basically the perichondrium and the cartilage will be sheared away from each other. They'll be ripped apart essentially. So that might look something like this. So again, the cartilage will just kind of stay where it is for the time being. And let's imagine that a little gap has formed like so. Okay, so the perichondrium is still there. But now, obviously, because you've been punched, some of those blood vessels will have, uh, will have ruptured, essentially. So you'll have bleeding. And you'll have bleeding into this little gap that I've drawn right here. So when it's actively bleeding, I suppose you could call it a hemorrhage. It's hemorrhaging. But what will happen is, is that that bleeding will, in, will, will continue. And obviously, it depends on how hard you've been hit and the area of damage. But that will bleed and bleed and bleed. And now what we have is this, is this kind of special little gap that's formed between the cartilage and the perichondrium. So what will happen is you will have something like this. And again, you'll see this if you ever see someone who's recently had damage to their external ear and they've got the beginnings of cauliflower ear, their ear will look sort of you know, swollen in, in a certain area. It will look like it's kind of ballooned out. So let's just draw the perichondrium back in. Uh, like so. So although it'll be damaged, it will still be there. And again, there will be a blood supply still. But what we now have is a is a quite a large pocket of blood. Okay, and this will eventually clot, and that will that will be called a hematoma, which is the same as a bruise essentially. So it's just blood which is collected underneath the skin. And just for the avoidance of doubt as well, I'll just draw the outer skin as also deflected like that. Okay. And this hematoma will not go away anytime soon. And when it clots, we now have a problem. So if we look at the cartilage here, that's going to be fine. Cartilage here is fine. Cartilage here is fine. But the cartilage that's lying directly underneath the hematoma will not be fine because it's now far away from the perichondrium. So it's going to be deprived. It's going to be starved of oxygen and nutrients. And if you can see the gap here, you know, they're quite far away from each other and it's, it's, it's not feasible for oxygen and nutrients to diffuse through the hematoma to the cartilage. That's not going to happen. So now a couple of things are going to occur. First and foremost, what you might see is some necrosis of the underlying cartilage because it's, because, again, because it's deprived of oxygen and nutrients, the tissue will die. So that's essentially what necrosis means or necrotizing. It's tissue death. Um, and that's because a necros is Greek for, for corpse. So we'll draw that in. So we have a loss of some cartilage here, loss of tissue. Let's draw those chondrocytes back in and the blood. So that's the first thing that, that may happen. The second thing that will happen is that you will have special cells invading the area where the hematoma is. So you'll have special cells coming out from the perichondrium and into the hematoma and these are called chondroblasts which I'm drawing as stars okay and again chondro cartilage and blast typically anything with blast in the name usually refers to a cell that secretes things and like builds something so if you think about osteoblast is a is a bone producing cell so chondroblast is a cartilage producing cell and the the way that it's actually able to come out of the perichondrium is because the perichondrium I've not drawn it, but it actually has two layers. And the layer that's, that's uh, closest to the cartilage, the innermost layer, is, some people call it the chondrogenic layer. 
And that's because that layer has special stem cells in it. So they're called mesenchymal cells. And as you know, stem cells can transform into lots of different things. So we say it differentiates into different things, which basically means it morphs into different cells, essentially. So these mesenchymal cells that are in the peri uh, perichondrium will differentiate into chondroblasts. And these chondroblasts will start laying down new cartilage. Some people call it neocartilage, or they'll lay it's, those cells are laying down new matrix. It's all the same thing. And at the same time, what may happen is these chondrocytes that, were res that are resident in the cartilage that are, are fairly close to the area of tissue damage, these may um, uh, uh, split, they may differentiate into chondroblasts. So they may divide and turn into chondroblasts. And I'm not entirely sure about the chemistry here, but I'm fairly sure that this process is triggered by a protein called HMGB1, um, or amphoterin, I think it's called. But essentially, um, I mean, I think it's fair to say that even if I'm not correct on the chemistry front, there are going to be a heck of a lot of chemokines and, and proteins around in this area. So I think it's reasonable to assume that the chondrocytes that are close to the edge will start laying down new matrix for cartilage. So what we now have is a lot of work going on to, to furiously get some cartilage into this area. So what we will eventually end up with is this hematoma will eventually go away and it will be filled with new cartilage. So essentially what we'll have is something like this. There we go. And again, the chondroblasts, once they've actually done their job and secreted and laid down lots of lovely cartilage matrix, will essentially become trapped in the matrix that they've made. So they'll become imprisoned within the cartilage and then, then we call them chondrocytes, essentially. So chondroblasts are just immature chondrocytes. And you'll see now that obviously there is a lovely closeness between the perichondrium and the new cartilage, so everything's back to normal, essentially. Except that we have obviously, <coughs> we have this, you know, new lump of cartilage which shouldn't be there essentially, but is fine. It's not going to harm the person in any way, shape or form. It's just, you know, it, it's just a, a physical deformity. Uh, but it's not harmful in any way, shape or form. So, you know, that's basically the nuts and bolts of, of the, or the pathogenesis of how cauliflower ear forms. Um, the treatment, I mean, the treatment is essentially, you know, very quickly you need to get rid of that blood. So you need to get rid of the hematoma. So if we go back to our original diagram where the blood is there, obviously the sooner you do it, the better, the easier it is to remove. But a lot of people, I mean, you should, you know, technically it should be done by a doctor. So the doctor may make an incision there and then they may just go in with a, with a needle or they may suck it out or um, they may use a, a syringe and basically just stick it in and then pull the plunger and, and get it out. Um, so a doctor should do that. Obviously, a lot of people just do it themselves. You know, they just sho sho shove a syringe in and then drain it themselves. Um, you're at a slightly higher risk, I think, if you do it yourself, um, unless you're obviously very, very careful and use sterile equipment and, you know, clean the ear with an alcohol wipe and so on and so forth. Um, so it's best to let a doctor do it. But essentially what you're doing is you're draining out all the blood that's in there. And then you're, that will hopefully allow the perichondrium to go back to normal and be in close contact with the cartilage. So you should hopefully return the structure to its original closeness like this. Okay, so essentially what, what you're doing is putting things back to normal, but what also needs to occur is compression. So the skin is back to normal. So what a lot of people will do is they'll apply special bandaging which puts pressure on this area and that pressure is essentially stopping the hematoma from, from reforming. Some people use very soft magnets, so they'll have one magnet on one side of the ear and then another magnet on the other side. Um, some people use these kind of plastic clips which clip onto the ear. And again, it's all doing the same thing. It's all applying compression to the traumatized area to make sure that you don't get this ballooning hematoma again. So there we go. That's how what cauliflower ear is. That's how it forms. That's how it's treated. Um, 
I hope you found that interesting. I certainly found it interesting. I find it really interesting how, uh, you know, the chondroblasts come out of the perichondrium and start laying down matrix and so on and so forth. Um, if anybody knows a little bit more about the chemistry that's involved there, please do let me know and leave a comment. If you guys have any questions, leave them down in the comments section. I will try my very best to get back to you, but I hope you enjoyed that. And of course, thank you very much for liking, watching and subscribing, and I will see you on the next video.